just, you know, it was like... Did it have the humbucker on it? Or the yeah, it had the humbucker on it. Yeah, yeah. When I got a little bit older, I guess I was probably 10, 9, 10, I started listening to music with my dad or listening to my dad's records. And my dad was a jazz guy, blues, um, folk, and my mom was, and classical. And that, that's where they, they sort of met, the classical, my mom and dad. My mom was a folk fan too, but she was a big opera fan. And so, you know, I started listening to my dad's records and probably the, the record or records that had the biggest impact on me was uh, Woody Guthrie records. Oh, okay. He did a, a record, the Dust Bowl Ballads, sure. and it was all about the Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. And w the, the thing that really affected me about Woody's records is he could... He, you know, he, he, he sang a simple song, he told a simple tale, but he made the, the people, like, real to you, you know, like, the imagery was so, so vivid in my mind that it really just had a big effect on me. You know, the music is not that complicated, you know, it's, it's not orchestrated, generally it's Woody and his guitar and, and him singing, but it really opened, like, this whole wor world to me that I hadn't seen, you know, that what these other people are dealing with, you know. I mean, I grew up in suburbia in New Jersey, you know, and I'm listening to them sing about people who lost their everything to, to the Dust Bowl, you know, and how they went out to California to try and make better and they were refused because they didn't have the money. So, that, so you know, that sort of, Woody Guthrie, I guess, was one of my biggest, earliest, yeah. um, and then there was uh, Huddy Ledbetter, who was better known as Leadbelly, mm -hmm. and he was, um, uh, you know, he was a former prisoner. He had murdered somebody and was um, pardoned by the by the governor of Louisiana. I think he was on Parchment's farm. But the thing that that um, where he had an impact on me is he would sing like prison songs and work songs. So he there was one song and he'd go look and look a yonder. Huh. Luke, and so he's like grunting in this song and like as, as a kid I was like wow man it's you know it's kind of you know uh, uh, stuff. yeah it was you for know. me and, and the imagery of it you know really really grabbed me and so relevant today huh yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 When, when did you first become aware of the bass um, well okay so so just to continue where we're okay. where we're where we're going with that it so it went from like when I was nine or ten, listening to my uh, parents' music, right. and I'm the youngest of five, so I have, I have uh, three older brothers and an older sister, and my oldest brother was like six years older than me. So once I got up a little ways, you know, like ten or eleven, he was then seventeen or eighteen, so he was out of the house a lot. Okay. So I would go up into his room and listen to his records. Which were that? Well, it. Uh, Frank Zappa, he listened to a lot of Frank Zappa, Jimi Hendrix, and a lot of funk and soul, Stevie Wonder. And now that to sort of get, answer your question, um, he had a James Brown record called Doing It to Death. And um, the, it's, um, the, it's a title tune, it's, it's called Doing It to Death, also known as Gonna Have a Funky Good Time. And the, the uh, what was his name, Frank, uh, no, Fred, Fred Thomas was Fred the, Thomas, yeah. was the bass cool, player. Yeah. And it was, that's, you know, that's when I was sort of like, this, this is bad, man. You know, <laughs> I was like, you know, sort of like, yeah, that, that kind of grabbed me when I really was like hearing the bass. You know?